episode of Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin, and today we are joined by Stuart Coleman, the uh, Hawaiian Islands manager of the Surfrider Foundation, and we're talking about Surfrider from beaches to bastions of change and getting into sort of making civics sexy again. Um, I'm not sure when civics was sexy to begin with, but maybe you'll enlighten me. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so, so Stuart, I mean, tell us a little bit about who you are. I know you're, you're an author, you're a surfer, you're an activist. How did, you, uh, how did you come to this place? How did you come to this work? Yeah, I um, have been surfing since I was a kid on the East Coast and uh, came out to Hawaii about uh, a little over 20 years ago to teach. Um, at, uh, several, I taught at Punahou and Iolani, and um, my hidden agenda was surfing, though, and that's what got me into Hawaii. And uh, then, you know, went from being a surfer to a surf writer and started writing about surfing and icons like Eddie Aikau and Rel Sun and all these just amazing um, Hawaiian uh, heroes of, of mine. And then kind of went surfer, surf writer to surf rider. I really kind of felt like I needed to do more uh, work on uh, the environment, you know, the playground uh, in our ocean where we surf and kind of we take it for granted. And surfers are sometimes the worst and the water quality is going down, the litter on the beach. And so started volunteering for them and, you know, became a volunteer leader. And then about five years ago, we created the first um, Hawaii coordinator position and then now the Hawaii manager. And we have five chapters across the island. Wow, and so the Surf Rider being a, a national foundation, it seems yeah. like you arrived at this uh, environmental focus in, in the way I think a lot of a lot of folks end up is it's with concern over environmental degradation or environmental yeah. quality and how that impacts you know our lives or the yeah. broader world around us. Yeah. So Surf Rider, I mean, what in a nutshell? I mean, what's the, the history of it as a foundation? Yeah. And its impetus. Well, it was started in 1984, and uh, it was started by a group of surfers in Malibu, California. And uh, they created this structure, kind of like Sierra Club, where we had chapters, and it just exploded. Um, and over the last 30 years, we ha now have about 85 chapters and numerous surfrider clubs and high schools and colleges, including UH. And uh, it's just you know 250,000 supporters, activists, and members across the country. And it's just been a real you know, revelation, uh, revelation for me um, that people, ordinary volunteers, can really affect change, you know, when they get together and they um, focus on certain issues. Um, that's what's been just amazing to me, that we have um, changed so much. And, you know, I remember, it really, for me, the biggest turning point was in Kakako, um, you know, 2006. And I saw what happened there, and I was like, that's amazing. I, I want to be, you know, a leader of this organization. Mm. So. Were you always a writer? I mean, it, it sounds like you've always been a surfer. Um, but then how, how did the writing play in, or how did you come to focus on sort of surf culture and, yeah. and surf icons locally? Yeah, surfing's always been my passion, but I've always felt that writing was my purpose, you know? And so just I've been writing since high school and first start, it started off as, um, you know, very angsty teenage poetry and uh, continued that way for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, slowly um, got into creative nonfiction, and that was you know my, my passion. Where I started writing about um, other figures and doing more biographical stuff. On Eddie Aikau was the first person I wrote about. And that was your book, Eddie Would Go. Yeah. So that's tell right. us a little bit about the, the process of writing that or engaging with you know research and yeah yeah it was that tale. fascinating. You know, it started off as just kind of you know series of articles, and then it grew and. Um, one of the key people was Peter Cole, who was a former teacher at Punahou, so I had heard of him there and, and met him on campus, and he was also one of the big wave pioneers of the North Shore um, back in the 50s. Um, and so he had surfed with Eddie Aikau, and I had interviewed him, and he was the head of the Oahu chapter, so everything kind of dovetailed, mm. you know. Um, he had kind of started that, and so I worked with him and he introduced me to the iCal family. I started writing more, turned into a book project, and then it, you know, it was a four year odyssey of research and writing. And uh, by the end of it, you know, I created this book that was just I, I it was bigger than me because I just couldn't believe how amazing this man was. Uh, Eddie Aikau is just truly like one of the great Hawaiians of the twentieth century along with Tukanamoku. Nice. Yeah. 
And so, but, but you did not stop there. Right? So no. Fierce Heart then came out subsequently. Yes, so um, about four years later, um, I published a, a book called Fierce Heart, because during the process of researching uh, for Eddie Would Go, I had met Brian Kealana and his family, and then there was Israel Kamakaviva Ole and Rel Sun, and I was just like, wow, these were, and they were kind of like all brothers and sisters there. Very, very tight community in one of the most Hawaiian um, on Oahu. And so I was like, how did this small little town on the west side, removed from everything, produce some of the largest you know, figures of the, of the 20th century? And so that turned into Fierce Heart. Um, and, uh, and in the process, and this is how things, I love how things dovetail. You know, you think your life is kind of random and <laughs> sometimes meaning is very elusive. But while I was finishing that book, I was really focusing in on Rel's son. And she had very, I mean, she didn't, first of all, she's a gorgeous native Hawaiian surfer and one of the best female surfers in the world, one of the best female divers in the world, um, and uh, the first female lifeguard in Hawaii broke through that glass ceiling. And she became one of the founding board members of the Surfrider Foundation um, when she got breast can after she got breast cancer because she felt like she didn't drink, she didn't smoke, she ate very healthy what came out of the sea, so she figured it had to be something in the water. And she spent most of her days in the water. Um, and so she joined the Survivor Foundation and was helping with water quality. And then right as I was finishing this book about you know her, I, uh, I became the first Hawaii um, manager in Hawaii. So it seems like uh, nearly every step along the way then is, is to some degree pushing you to the position that you're in now. Kind of, yeah. And so as the, as the Hawaiian Islands manager of Surf Rider, you said there's, there's five chapters currently? Yeah. And what's that distribution like? What are the, who participates in this? And yeah. how, do, how do people get engaged? How do people hear about it? Right. So it's all volunteer, which is important for people to remember. Sometimes they're like, well, why don't you guys do this? Why don't you guys do that? And we're, like, we're all volunteers. These are people who have full-time jobs and just, you know, dedicate and donate their time to you know, issues of water quality, beach access, responsible coastal development, and marine plastic pollution among some of the issues. And uh, it's just amazing that, that people are so passionate about it that they really do commit to you know, sometimes as much as 10, 15 hours a week um, on this volunteer uh, position, this chapter, mm -hmm. and they become leaders in their community. So, you just join the local chapter. There's one on each island, and then two on the big island um, in Hilo and Kona. Hmm. And people just join, and they get kind of addicted to it, you know, the whole process. We do generally monthly beach cleanups around the island, so that's a good way for people to get involved. Mm -hmm. They can go to the website if you want to check it out. It's uh, surfrider.org and then slash uh, Oahu, Maui, Hilo, Kona, or Kauai. Hmm. Yeah. And so you can go there and get a sort of a quick overview of what that chapter is up to. Exactly. And so in terms of the actual the role, so then your your position is sort of being the the translator between the sort of national programming and local programming? Yeah, and yeah, and it goes both ways. You know, it's um, I kind of convey a lot of local concerns that are bubbling up, you know, to national, and then they have uh, programs you know, nationally that they, you know, I help implement here. Um, one of the largest is you know, Rise Above Plastics, and uh, that's our campaign to um, help reduce single-use plastic pollution um, from water bottles um, to cigarette butts and um, to you know everything your food comes in at a plate lunch, you know, <laughs> all those things. And so we help you know with the plastic bag ban, passing those in each county, making Hawaii the first state in the country. No. Um, to, to ban single-use grocery, plastic grocery bags. What is the, uh, when do things go effect here in Honolulu County? July 1st, coming up very soon. July 1st. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, hoard your bags. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the black market begins. Yeah, exactly. Um, People, there were, when we were testifying for this originally, there were fears like, what will we do? The world will come to an end. <laughs> It's like there are things called reusable bags, and they are out there. You can still use plastic bags, you know, for your garbage and for yeah. other uses. Newspapers. The only thing this will affect is the most um, abundant source of those. Where at the grocery stores, you know, yeah. when you buy a pack of gum and they're double bagging you and you know, <laughs> giving it, those bags were the ones we wanted to. We're reduce. targeting. Yeah. yeah, and it sounds like I mean, despite the uh, 
potential misgivings that some may have, but it's been fairly effective in the, you know, some of the other counties where it's been implemented with uh, no revolutions or yeah. uh, mass overthrows. Yeah, so exactly. Um, there were, uh, we did a PSA of a before and after shot of the Maui landfill after it passed. Wow. And I think that was the convincing factor for Oahu. And before, there are just bags everywhere, and the trees and the bushes, it's just littered everywhere. And then the next shot, there are no bags anywhere. Hmm. And life continued. Um, you know, Somehow we got somehow by. Somehow they yeah. got by. And so As if we had hands to carry exactly. things, or <laughs> backpacks. Or, As if know. Costco, you know. Um, didn't even exist. And so, you know, Costco is a great model of not only are they not using plastic bags and paper bags, but they're reusing our, their, all their cardboard. Mm -hmm. And so it's just they're saving money and it's efficient and there are no complaints. And also for them, it's a you know, mechanism of waste management conceivably exactly. as well. They don't have to bail and ship and exactly. move all the things around. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, July 1st, uh, what else in terms of some of the policy actions that you guys have been involved with, do you, mm -hmm. do you really sort of uh, look to as, as the, the accomplishments that surf ride, the, yeah. the crest of the wave that you are now riding? <laughs> yes. If you will. The, um, the biggest one was definitely the, the bag ban, which took, I mean, that was the greater part of my five-year career was really focusing on that. Mm -hmm. And then um, since, we've been working on a number of campaigns, but the biggest of which since then, because that really was a national first. I mean, that got international news. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, the second one was um, what we, we just passed through the state legislature this session. We had mm -hmm. a very, very successful session. And um, that's the um, smoke-free uh, or tobacco-free beaches and parks bill. Mm -hmm. um, and so Hawaii's posed, poised to become the first state in the country, which is exciting, to um, not have uh, smoking and tobacco products on the beaches and parks. And this, for us, is very impactful because you know, as someone who leads beach cleanups and has been <laughs> doing that for 15 years, it was without a doubt the number one thing we find at every single beach cleanup. Well, it's good. It's, it's sort of like you're doubling up your work then. You're yeah. reducing the workload for the beach cleanups and potentially the ick factor. And exactly. then also, you know, in terms of just environmental enjoyability as, as you're uh, right. lazing on the beach. Exactly. And, then, you know, there were health issues too about secondhand smoke. And, you know, we, again, there were people saying, you know, oh, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be disastrous. People won't come here. And we read a testimony where this guy representing a smokers union of uh, alliance of you know, whatever was like, oh, no one will come to Hawaii <laughs> if you do this. And he was literally like <laughs> hacking up uh, all kinds of stuff, you know. And, and I was like, I'll cede my time to him because he's a more effective spokesperson, <laughs> you know. Because the, sort of the no, backfire of yeah. his own intent. And in Maui, when they passed it, there was no, you know, no... Uh, kind of downturn in tourism, and there were even not even complaints. We expected blowback, to, mm -hmm. to be honest. And when the Maui bill passed, we didn't get any. Wow. Like people realized it was the wrong thing to do, you know, because m almost 90% of people who smoke are just going to, you know, litter it right there, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so this has been, yeah, a great thing for us. And we're just waiting for the governor to sign it. Um, and then yes. tomorrow we're going to the governor's office for a signing. So. Has there been any, uh, I understand this is a fairly recent thing still, has there been like a subsequent uh, before and after Maui beach cleanup shot? Or is that something that we can maybe expect down the line as, yeah. as the smoking ban goes into effect? Or? Yeah. And we did a, a study that um, we do International Coastal Cleanup Day is the third weekend, third Saturday in September. Mm. And so we've done it there a number of years. And we count every single piece of trash that we get, which you can imagine is, it's a serious uh, gross audience. and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, and time consuming, but we did it before the Oahu bill passed and after, and we found you know that there was over uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but over a thirty five percent decrease wow. just you know from year to year from before and after the ban, um, and that was before it even really been enforced. Well, this yeah. is an impressive work. Uh, we're going to take a, a brief break. But after these messages, uh, join us back to learn a little bit more about the works of Surfrider and their Hawaiian Islands manager, Stuart Coleman. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. 
A Hanukkah ko means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at A Hanukkah ko. Every week, we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. We're joined this week by Stuart Coleman, the Hawaiian Islands manager of the Surfrider Foundation. We're talking about Surfrider, from beaches to bastions of change, getting into sort of making civic sexy. And so you were just telling us about some of the great work that you guys have accomplished in the past, from uh, smoking bans on beaches to plastic bag bans around the state. Um, what else is, has got you excited? Uh, what else are, do you guys have your, your hands or yeah. your fins, I guess, would be? <laughs> yeah. So those were kind of more related to the Rise Above Plastics campaign and, and marine plastic pollution. And um, the other campaign that we're really excited about is our, our water quality issues. And so we had two bills that, um, that are, have passed this session. The governor signed our stormwater runoff bill, um, which I think you helped us with. And uh, that was um, basically to allow the counties to um, kind of uh, create policies that incentivize, encourage people to not have stormwater runoff, run off their properties into the you know, streets and into the storm drains and directly into the ocean, frankly. I don't think most people realize that's the largest source of water pollution. Just what comes off your property and off the streets. Because you can imagine there's heavy metals, there's gas, oil, cigarette butts, you know, you name all kinds of chemicals. Um, fertilizers, pesticides, and that goes directly into the ocean. Especially going with all this non-point source pollution that's rolling across our impervious surfaces. Exactly. So this uh, state uh, you know, push has then essentially paved the way for counties to then uh, set parameters and, yeah. and whatnot to, to enforce uh, stormwater regulation on exactly. sites within the specific yeah, characteristics. Yeah, right? yeah. With, with you know certain characteristics, and it's basically incentivizing you that you know, if you um, build like permeable, uh, you know, using stones instead of paving everything mm -hmm. and try to capture it, rain barrels and bioswales. And, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about the work that we do together, you know, with permablets and, and um, our ocean friendly gardens, just to get that water back into the soil, mm -hmm. into the aquifer, so it, you know, replenishes our drinking water supply. So that was the first bill the governor signed last month. And then tomorrow, uh, Raphael Bergstrom and I, um, the Oahu chapter coordinator, mm -hmm. will be going to the governor's office for the signing of our cesspool uh, bill, which uh, we worked with the Department of Health on for the last few years. Um, to Most people don't realize this, but uh, Hawaii is the only state in the country that still allows cesspools, and the last state banned them 50 years ago. Um, cesspools are just a hole in the ground, basically, and the stuff yep. leaches out all the time. Stuff being a kind yes, of yeah. <laughs> Yes, being uh, a very gentle way uh, of putting it. Um, and so we passed a bill this session that will give $10,000 tax credits to homeowners who upgrade from test pools to septic tanks or anaerobic um, septic systems mm -hmm. or connect to sewer. Um, so again, really trying to incentivize people to do the right thing, focusing and targeting on um, all those areas that are near streams um, and near the ocean. Riparian and coastal zones. Yeah, that, that you know, can get into our drinking water or into you know, our recreational waters. Because um, that's a very serious threat as well. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting uh, issue that we, we somehow still face. Uh, of, you know, cesspools is effectively being um, nothing greater than digging a hole in the ground. And yeah and filling it with yes. what you no longer need inside of your body. And literally um, that the whole, the para legal, I think, parameter description is that it is deeper than it is wide, you know? I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a crazy thing that we allowed to happen. And so we're also working, because the EPA has been fining um, the, the state of Hawaii for all kinds of contamination. So we, this is something we, a public health issue as well as an environmental issue. 
that we really need to get going on, and this will help. And then we're also working to do administrative rule changes. We've been working, like I said, with Department of Health, mm -hmm. with uh, Ted Boland um, at the AG's office, and uh, been really, I think that's part of our success is that we've been trying to form large alliances with all kinds of environmental groups, health groups, and government agencies. So the, I mean, I know part of the issue of, of what's kept sewerage connections around from putting my sort of planning lens on is, yeah. you know, there, there were concerns about developments going on, or at least around Honolulu, mm -hmm. in decades past, where, um, you know, the, say we're building on these big, big ridge lines, that essentially the public cost of infrastructure being implemented right. would not be regained through the, essentially, land rent through taxes mm -hmm. that would be uh, yielded by these various properties. And so it sort of, these various loopholes are like yeah. not full embrace of uh, what we could call, I think, an appropriate technology, like, yeah. say, septic tanks or sewage systems, um, even though they, they definitely have their own issues. Yeah. Uh, but they're at least a little more graceful uh, right. <laughs> than the uh, cesspool solution. So yeah. it's, it's pretty inspiring to hear that, you know, the, that folks particularly um, are be, will be incentivized as opposed to, you know, uh, find or, you know, taking, yeah. taking the carrot, not the stick approach. It's a little boat, though. Um, just so, so we're clear, like, it, you know, it, they've tried both. Just the fines is a very, you know, effective way, but it creates a lot of public tension, yeah. you know, and then just the incentives don't work because you need a little, and so it really is a boat, mm -hmm. you know. You, you will benefit by, um, you know, keeping the water on your property, the stormwater runoff, yeah. um, and then you will be penalized if, you know, if you were contributing a lot to that because it's contributing um, to, you know, all these various water, pollution. water quality issues. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, uh, I, I, you get uh, just a whole slew of wins <laughs> as I'm looking down at my notes here. So, you also had a hand in, in some big changes recently at the University of Hawaii, correct? A uh, very, very small role. We just supported, um, you know, there were uh, professors and 350.org groups um, and students and just so many um, people that came together to encourage the Board of Regents, you know, to divest from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've made history in Hawaii, literally international history, uh, international news and history in Hawaii by not only divesting from fossil fuels, we're the largest American university to do so, wow. um, but also by passing, um, you know, Representative Chris Lee's bill mm -hmm. to uh, make Hawaii 100% uh, renewable energy um, by 2045. Mm -hmm. So those things are just, you know, and, and University of Hawaii itself, net zero energy, um, you know, within that time frame. So it's, it's pretty impressive that... Lots of, lots of lofty goals. I mean, I'm excited to see how these things start playing out in practice and what yeah. the, the sort of meeting out of, you know, having these uh, sort of goal lines or finish lines yeah. uh, now some degree set. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting next few years to try and sort out uh, from a state level, from sort of an institutional level, yeah. how we then begin broaching some of these, because we've, we've, we've done a lot in terms of uh, committing ourselves to do things, right. and it feels like there still is a little bit of a, we need a little more teeth yeah. on a few uh, closer uh, sort of rungs as we, we right. climb up there. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's one of my big things, uh, kind of pet peeves, is that, you know, in our government agencies, there's this kind of anti-government feeling that we've inherited from the, the Reagan era, and it's been a you know kind of right wing mantra. You know, government is the is the problem. Government is us. Yeah. If you say government is the problem, then that's a bit of set up, so, you know masochism, basically, and self hatred because we are the government. We elect the people. They are our friends. They are our neighbors. They are people. And if you don't like what's happening, get involved and you run for office. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way to do it. And uh, you know, frankly, the problem is government agencies are not doing their job. You know, they're so afraid to penalize, you know, corporate polluters and people who are just obviously doing the wrong things, mm -hmm. where that's a source of income. They're complaining that they don't have enough money. But if DOH enforced some of these, you know, regulations in DLNR, it would be a big source of income. And people would support it because people want, I, I you know, I, I have to believe they want to do what's right and what's best for the general public. Mm -hmm. and. And these regulations were put in place not to be a burden, not to be a pain in the ass, but to really encourage good policies and better living. Well, I think that's definitely uh, 
you know, there, there's always sort of these, these unfunded tasks that are yeah. often how they're pitched by various departments. Yeah. But uh, should they go after, you know, as you're saying, some of these sort of like corporate polluters or whatnot, there's often, uh, I think, a very uh, popular dialogue that, that can be, you know, it's almost like the trump card in a lot of these is that it, it will increase the cost of living, that it doesn't make jobs, yeah. or it sort of like stymies development, or these various other sort of pitches of like, yeah. well, no, it'll, it'll, it'll impact your life now. And hence, like these longer-term pushes, we, we shouldn't be right. as focused on. Yeah, it, it, and it's, it is a mantra that is used over and over again, and it's often just not true. Yeah. Going back to the divestment thing, you know, they say, um, you know, well, oh, we can't, we can't do this. You know, oil prices are already too high, um, so we can't levy, you know, carbon tax or any of these taxes. These are the most profitable companies on the planet and in the history of humankind. Um, Norway, you know, uh, kind of levied the most intense taxes on these things to do offshore oil, oil drilling mm -hmm. and oil drilling there. And every person in Norway has, like, millions of dollars in their credit, like, for each person. Mm -hmm. um, so they can handle any crisis, any downturn in the economy. Wow. Um, and it's used for the public good, for, you know, for health care. Infrastructure. Or infrastructure. Yeah. Education. Yes, exactly. It's on, it's on public like transportation, a, you know. And it's, it's far too complex. I yeah. Think we should just, uh. yeah. And so it's, a, it's an argument that they use, big business uses, and it's, you know, it's, it's effective, you know, yeah. because they, people go, oh, yeah, we can't do this. And the analogy I use also is that, you know, we hear that with each new development. Oh, well, we have to you know, do this development as jobs. And it's like, well, do you want longer term, more sustainable jobs? Or do you want boom and bust economy with mm -hmm. construction like we see in Kaka'ako? You know, my friends are working on a documentary called Third City right now that I'm part of. Wow. And, you know, we have 30, more than 30 condo towers. Most of them are luxury condo towers going in, in a one or two square mile area. And we've also already got the worst traffic in the country and you know we're fighting neck and neck with LA you know, to have the worst traffic per capita and so it's like as a planner you know you know this better than anyone it's just sometimes we just we're such in a rush to make money and short-term profits that we don't even feed our long-term growth and prosperity well and I think part of the issue being that you know when, when some of those were planned that they were supposed to and they're actively supposed to incorporate affordable housing yeah and lower income housing and so the sort of uh, intervening decades were able to, to sort of massage and, mm -hmm. and modify and so now that housing can be built elsewhere or be credited through various mechanisms exactly and so I think part of that sort of longer term planning one of the issues that you do end up uh, facing with these, these sort of like distant bills that immediately uh, that don't necessarily impact decision makers in the short term mm -hmm. is the capacity of them to then say all right so what is 100 percent renewable what does that mean? Means, <laughs> means something conceivably very different, right. you know, uh, some years yeah. down the line. Exactly. Um, and so I think it's very important then from, from sort of a populist engagement, um, uh, uh, civic, sexy society, yeah. if you will, uh, <laughs> that, that, you know, we maintain the, the pressure and the discussion and, and the, the engagement, really. Yeah. Um, and, and you guys have been doing uh, some other work. I mean, I know uh, in terms of some interesting funding approaches, your Ocean Friendly Garden Program, mm -hmm. and then also some pretty, involved with some pretty interesting studies with, regarding pesticides. So yeah. tell me a little bit about that statewide pesticide study. What's, what's going on there? Yeah, so we've seen a, a, a decline in water quality just across the state. And, uh, you know, you can also see it in parts around the country. Um, Beach Act funding every year, which um, funds a lot of the, these coastal water quality programs across the country, um, has not been funded, and Surfrider has lobbied you know, the Congress, and each year we've got them to restore, you know, it's only $10 million, but it's really, it's what's keeping these programs alive. Mm -hmm. Our Clean Water Branch here, for instance, kind of really depends on that money. So that's been a successful campaign. And, you know, part of it is what we talk about is that runoff, and then cesspools, we have so many cesspools here, and that's the bacterial, bacteriological um, kind of inputs, you know, that is really decreasing water quality. But then we're also the GMO capital, you know, of the country as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these GMO companies slipped in and kind of took over all the, you know, sugarcane and, and pineapple fields um, across the islands. And uh, so we were asked to, to help with a study to, to see how much of those pesticides 
you know, are getting into the water. And it's not just the GMO companies. W you know, there's a theory that actually residential use might be worse mm -hmm. because they're combining and they're really trying to make sure it stays on the property. The residents might be the worst offender because they're overusing it. Yeah. So they're overpaying, they're using too much. Underregulated. And underregulated, and it's going right out into local streams and then during rain events going right into the ocean. Um, so that's another, we've got a statewide study for that. Wow. Well, um, we're going to take another quick break, but join us back here uh, after these messages. This is Alice Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ, and my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in, in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. All right, aloha, and welcome back to Sustainable Hawaii. I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. Today we are joined by Stuart Coleman, the Hawaiian Islands Manager of the Surfrider Foundation. We're talking about Surfrider from beaches to bastions of change. We've been hearing about uh, your work as a surf writer, your work as a surf rider, uh, some of the fascinating uh, ways you've been engaging with uh, statewide policy related to uh, you know, pesticides, cesspools, uh, plastic bags, and whatnot. And, and you would you'd made reference earlier to sort of what, what you felt to be a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a the pun <laughs> intentionally, um, but then in, in 2006, yeah. you had referenced. So, so tell us sort of that that, that story or what what shifted for you. Yeah, so 2006 was you know two huge events. First was the worst uh, sewage spill in Hawaii's history and one of the worst in the country. Um, we had 40 days of you know of rain and 48 million gallons of raw sewage was pumped into the Alawai. Um, you know, one person died after mm -hmm. falling, getting infection. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing that happened that year, it was a turning point for me, was that um, there was uh, a plan to develop three luxury high-rise condos on the land at Point Panic, which is public park land. Mm -hmm. And they had kind of, you know, slipped a mention in in the paper about there being, you know, a little uh, feedback session, and they were doing a press conference. And so. We showed up, uh, just a bunch of scrappy surfers, and started asking questions. And we were like, "Well, how? You know, they were supposed to be have aff affordable housing mm -hmm. in it, which they don't even say anymore because it's not affordable yeah. um, to any of us. Um, so they say reserve housing. And uh, you know, we we just said this is unacceptable. You know, this is park land. How did this? You know, the HCDA had just blindly said you can do this because they have um, control of that area." And so we started fighting it, and I think at first they were kind of dismissing us, but um, it, it just the movement built and built. And then for me, the, just that watershed moment was we marched um, from Kakako Park to the Capitol, 400 plus people all wearing red shirts mm -hmm. saying, you know, Kakako not for sale, uh, excuse me, save our Kakako, yeah. public land not for sale. And we lined up in the back of the auditorium during the uh, governor's state of the state address. And it was a shift. Every politician who had supported, you know, the bill to build there ran away. And they were like, we never supported that. And the project died. Mm. And that was the first time I thought, wow, we have power. You know, the people have power to change the way things are done in Hawaii. And I was like, OK, I'm getting more involved. I have to step up my efforts and, you know, Eventually, you know, became vice chair of the chapter, and then uh, the first, you know, Hawaii quarter position coordinator position. We realized we needed someone, a staff person, um, and so that's it. We've just kind of grown from there, realizing that it's all about civic engagement. Mm -hmm. And so, in terms of that movement building, I mean, what what strategies do you see as being effective, or how do you relate that, uh, bring that, I guess, a 
essentially making that civic engagement something sexy, something yeah, to yeah. be that, that is attractive for people to engage with, as opposed to feeling like you're, you know, essentially hitting your head against yeah, the wall, exactly. or dealing with faceless bureaucracies. Right, and believe me, I, you know, I shared the same frustration and, you know, anger, kind of local politics and government and, and business as usual, and that resistance to change. And then, you know, started meeting people, you know, like Represent Chris Lee and Nicole Lowen, and, you know, friends of ours that were involved in and had run for office and were making changes. And uh, so we started getting more involved, like with the bag bill. And then um, we were able to hire uh, Raphael Bergstrom, um, our Wahoo chapter coordinator. And we came up with this idea that uh, he led this Civics is Sexy workshop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were kind of you know, being playful with that. And then we realized, like, we really do have to make Civics sexy because people just think it's so boring mm -hmm. or, you know, it's more like S&M than anything. You know, it's just a <laughs> punishing process. <laughs> and so we had this huge maybe workshop. Maybe that's part of the appeal. For maybe, yeah. maybe, yes. Um, and we had this workshop at the beginning of session. And, you know, people spent four hours on a Saturday. We had, like, more than... 50, 60 people. It was people. a good turnout, yeah. And, you know, it was a great turnout, and people got really engaged. And we said, these are the bills that we're going to be supporting. We had started working on them, you know, the year before, and people sent in testimony and supported them. And we got government agencies to see why, like, this is for their best interest. And so you can see, you know, this is the group that attended. And it was just, it just started building and building. And I think, you know, maybe civics, civics is actually getting sexy again. Well, and it seems like part of that is, you know, helping helping to identify what people are passionate about. And, and I really liked how you phrased that earlier about, you know, your passion versus your purpose. Yeah. And so finding the things that are, that are we're really driven to do and then finding things that sort of fulfill us in a different type of way and, and ideally finding the confluence of those. Right. So in terms of your, your uh, approach to work and overall, I mean, how do you navigate between these sort of maybe competing poles or right. at least competing aspects of your yeah. time? Well, Surf Rider's got a very unique uh, mission statement. It says, you know, we're dedicated to the protection and enjoyment of the world's ocean, beaches, and waves. Mm. And that enjoyment is key. Um, some environmentalists say the best thing you can do for the ocean is go to the beach. Because when you realize what's at stake and how beautiful it is and how good you feel when you're in the woods, mm -hmm. whether you're hiking, surfing, biking in, on a green way, and you realize, wow, this is what life is about. It's not about the traffic. It's not about the nine to five. You know, it's like it's moments with our family, our friends, you know, our loved ones. That's what you have to do. And so we have to get more engaged with nature and realize, like, you have to fight to protect it because there are people, and they're not bad people. They're friends of ours, you know, mm -hmm. but they want to develop every square inch that they can of this island because there's a lot of money involved. And we have to point out that no, we want a, a different lifestyle. We want more land. We want Kakako Park for the people, mm -hmm. not for luxury high-rise owners, um, you know, who might live abroad and never even spend time in Hawaii except for once or twice a year. So, you know, that enjoyment part is, I think, is very important. You have to find out what you're passionate about, and then find your purpose, your way to protect that. And so, how does that translate? I mean, to to sort of put it in even broader perspective, well, how does that translate into a sustainable Hawaii? Or what does that type uh -huh. of a future look like to you? Yeah, I think. We need to, um, you know, say it's like uh, that movie Network, you know, it says I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore, you know, and people are screaming out the windows, you know, in the whole city. That's how we warm up before the show. Every exactly. Time. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And we kind of need to do that and to say enough, enough mm -hmm. with the developments, with, you know, more kind of little plots. We say it's a transit oriented development, but we've got development going on everywhere and say, we need to figure out our infrastructure problems first, figure out rail first, um, and, and you know, it looks like it's gonna happen, but we need to make sure that it's efficient, that, you know, that it does serve the most people, and that you know, as part of this documentary, people keep these public officials saying, well, when rail comes, it'll be a lot better. It's like, well, rail 10, 15 years down the line. We're talking about the worst traffic in the country now. So yeah. we, I think we need to put a, a moratorium on new developments and building and, and really work on the infrastructure, work on the traffic problems, mm -hmm. and work on these things. And it sounds really big, but it's, it's, it's as simple as working on your garden, doing community gardens. Um, you're working on a project we're talking about, about doing gardens for you know, the homeless. Um, so they can come self-sufficient and learn how to grow crops and with, but yeah, yeah, 
And so it's, you know, it, there's lots of things that you can do at the local level and just kind of find your passion, you know, to, to engage. So in terms of that, that, I guess, next step of engagement, so what, what are the ways that people can engage with Surfrider? What are the ways that you suggest they get engaged from a sort of a sexy civics manner or just yes. movement building in general? Well, we'll be holding uh, more uh, civic, civics is sexy workshops. Um, so I really encourage people to get involved with that. Um, especially at the beginning of the legislative session, you know, next January. Um, and then also we have International Surfing Day coming up, um, Saturday, June 20th. And that's where everyone goes surfing. Right? Yes, everyone uh, across the island <laughs> and across the world, actually. It really is an international event. We have people uh, across the world holding events. And we're going to, the Oahu chapter is holding theirs um, at Diamond Head. Hawaii chapter is holding theirs in uh, Poipu and. Uh, you know, we've got them going on all across uh, the islands, and you can just go to um, surfrider.org backslash ISD for International Surfing Day and get involved. But come on down. You know, it's, it's, we'll be talking about our bills and the campaigns that we're working on. And it's just a great way to come and give back to the ocean and celebrate what's so great about living in Hawaii. Sounds magnificent. Mm -hmm. um, well, is there any other sort of poignant takeaway? I mean, if you're going to... Tell, tell people the, the, the most important steps that they can take yeah. um, at the, on their home or from a policy perspective or whatnot. Like, what are, what are their uh, marching orders? Yes, people? their marching orders are um, think about ways that you can uh, improve, you know, your own little environment around your house, around your beach, in your neighborhood. And the good news is Hawaii has the best public access um, system in the country. So if you go to capital.hawaii.gov, mm -hmm. you can find out who your local representative is, and you should know that. Um, know who your representative is, know who your senator is, know who your council member is, and call them up and write them and just tell them, these are your concerns, this is what I'd like to see. And then just find out, it is exciting. It's not a pain in the butt, as people think. It's exciting. Once you get involved and you start seeing changes happen, you'll want to do more. Mm -hmm. I had heard an interesting suggestion recently uh, that was, have. 10 minutes in your day, it's even 10 minutes in your week. You know, yeah. during the sessions, just like have, have there are so many organizations that are current that, mm -hmm. that go through and do a lot of the translation mm -hmm. from the sort of uh, bureaucratic and policy wonk speak into yeah. something that makes sense and arrives as a blurb in your inbox that yeah. you're not necessarily going to know all the ins and outs of it, but you can have the talking points and yeah. then just spend 10 minutes, write, yeah. a, write a letter, make a call. Exactly. Um, you know, there's really simple ways that have a low barrier of access exactly. that, that can have, you know, and there are all page. kinds of groups, you know, from the Sierra Club to, uh, you know, the hub in Kaka'ako. I mean, there's a working space. I mean, there's just so many groups that are looking for cool, active members to support them and to bring their unique skills, you know, whether that's graphics or web design or just managing cleanups or get-togethers and talks. Well, thank you very much for uh, coming in today. My pleasure. Thanks for sharing uh, some of your unique skills. It's yeah. lovely uh, to have you on and lovely to get a chance to speak as always. So yeah, once again, Stuart Coleman, the uh, Hawaiian Islands manager of the Surf Rider Foundation, a surf writer, a surf rider, uh, and a man of money hats. Um, so once again, I'm your host, Hunter Hevelin. Join us here every week for Sustainable Hawaii, the show about making the transition from being individual consumers with rights to building communities of producers with responsibility. Aloha.